Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today I want to share with you something that I believe that the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart. And it is about the keys of the kingdom, binding and loosing. So in Matthew 16, 19, Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. A follow up in Matthew 18, 18 says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, these verses are used to state that believers are able to bind and loose the devil, demons, spirits. But as good Bereans, we need to examine if these things are so. I know that the teaching and practices of a good many Christian leaders, and I'm using that term loosely, proclaim that we can bind the devil, and with their great swelling words, they use long prayers to tell the devil what to do. But we have no example of this in scripture. Now we see that Jesus commanded unclean spirits not to speak unless there was a specific question that needed to be answered before he cast them out. When the devil came to tempt him, Jesus used the word of God and he used it correctly to resist him. And then the devil left him, according to Matthew 4:11. James 4:7 says to resist the devil, and he will flee, but no mention of binding. And this is the exact example that Jesus provided to us. Jude writes about certain men creeping in unnoticed, ungodly men who were long ago marked out for condemnation, who turned the grace of God into a license to sin, denying the Lord God and Jesus Christ. And this is because Jesus came to save us from our sins, not so we could continue in them. Jude says he wants to remind us of those who came out of Egypt who were afterward destroyed because of unbelief. Going on to talk about the angels who sinned, being reserved for judgment. Using Sodom and Gomorrah, he says they are set forth as an example that, of those that will suffer the punishment of eternal fire. So these ungodly men have crept into the faith. Yet in the same way, these dreamers defile their bodies, reject authority, and slander glorious beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, did not presume to bring a slanderous charge against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, let's note what the word slanderous means here. It is abusive or scurrious language, blasphemy. It is literally slow and sluggish to call something good that really is good and slow to identify what is truly bad that is really evil. Blasphemy switches right for wrong and wrong for right. It calls what God disapproves right, which exchanges the truth of God for a lie. Slander, detraction, speech injurious to another's name, a judgment pronounced in reproachful terms. This is Strong's 988 in the Greek. <clears throat> the angels do not speak evil of the devil. Jesus did not speak evil of the devil. Therefore, we should not speak evil of the devil. Now, in context of the verse in Matthew 16, Jesus asks Peter, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they respond with answers of John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus asks a very pointed question. But who do you say that I am? Now, Peter's response is, you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. And Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In verse 18, Jesus said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I know that the name Peter means rock, but let's take another look here. Is Peter the prophet that Moses said would be raised up by God and whom God would put his words in his mouth and tell all that he commanded in Deuteronomy 18? Now, Deuteronomy 18, 19 says, And I will hold accountable anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Now, this is also referenced in Acts 3, 22 and 23. Is Jesus going to build his church upon Peter? Or is he going to build his church upon Peter's response of you are the Christ, the son of the living God? Jesus is the prophet that God promised would be raised up. And it is his words that speak what the father commands. John 14, 24 says, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. The word that you hear is not my own, but it is from the Father who sent me. In Acts 4, 11, it says, This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And this is also in Psalm 118, 22. Jesus is the cornerstone. Isaiah 28, 16 says, So this is what the Lord God says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will never be shaken. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says, For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. It is upon this foundation of Jesus, the precious cornerstone, that the builders build upon. Peter is a builder building upon this foundation of Jesus being the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, in the context of Jesus giving keys of the kingdom, that what is bound in earth will be bound in heaven and loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven in Matthew 16. Do we see any verses in the entire chapter that are talking about demons or spirits? When Peter came to rebuke him, Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus did not bind Satan. He said, Get behind him. And this is really the only mention of Satan or a spirit being mentioned in this entire chapter. In Matthew 18, 18, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, go read the entire chapter and you are not going to find Satan or spirits being discussed. What is being discussed? is humbling ourselves like little children. That whoever causes one of these to sin, it would be better if he were drowned. Jesus tells the parallel of leaving the 99 to find the one that is straying into sin. He goes on to say, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now this is right after saying, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with him, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to you, Tell it to the church, the assembly. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, 
Peter understood the context of what Jesus was saying as forgiveness because he comes to Jesus and asks him, how many times do I have to forgive my brother who sins against me? And Jesus tells him 70 times seven and goes on further to provide context in the story of a king settling accounts for his servants. One of the servants owes a great sum to the master, but the servant is unable to pay. The master is moved with compassion and forgives him the debt. Now that servant in turn goes out to one who owes him a debt, but this man is also unable to pay his debt. Now, after just being forgiven of all of his debt, he now demands that this servant pay what is owed, not forgiving the debt, but throwing him into prison. In Matthew 18, 32, it says, Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. The key here being, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. When Jesus taught how to pray, he said, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors in Matthew 6, 12, going on to say, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Now, in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Jesus said, Judge not that you not be judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Now, I know that there are a host of doctrines that circulate around about what this judging means and how we're not to judge this and judge that and judge whatever. But Jesus is clearly telling us that this judging is unforgiveness. If you do not forgive, you cannot be forgiven. This is the measure that is used. If you do not forgive the servant sinning against you, the master will not forgive you. The same measure of forgiveness offered by you to others is the measure of forgiveness you are able to receive. Romans 2 and verse 1 says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on another. For on whatever grounds you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. We all sin. Maybe not all in the same way, but we all sin. And we all need forgiveness. But we have a responsibility to offer the forgiveness that we seek from God to others. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Jesus said, if you might forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you might retain any, they are retained in John twenty twenty three. The term bind in Matthew means to forgive, forbid, excuse me, declare unlawful. And loose means properly to loose, unleash, let go, release, unbind, and declare lawful. Is forgiveness God's will on the earth? 
this is what loving God and honoring him first, then your neighbor as yourself, on which all the law and the prophets hang, doing unto others as you want done for yourself. So where in scripture do we see the apostles or the disciples binding a spirit? They did not bind them. They cast them out. Jesus did not bind spirits. He also cast them out. In Luke 13, we have an example of a woman being loosed from a spirit of infirmity. But did Jesus bind the spirit or did he cast it out so that she could be made free? If it was only bound, she would not have been free. Luke 10, 19 through 20 says, Behold, I give you the authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Yet do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the heavens. Although Jesus gave authority to us to cast out spirits, the power over the enemy is that your sins are forgiven. And this is confirmed in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them. This is how Jesus bound the strong man and plundered his house. Jesus bound the devil by setting us free from our sins. He died on the cross for our sins to disarm the power of the enemy. By his forgiveness of our sins, we are to forgive the others of their sins in the same measure of the forgiveness that we seek. This, my friends, is the key of the kingdom. If we bind the sins of others by walking in unforgiveness, they are bound in heaven. And if we loose the sins of others by walking in forgiveness to them, they are loosed in heaven. Now, I ask that you take this to the Father to ask him for confirmation of what is being said here. Don't just take my word for it. Go and search the scriptures yourself. And if you find that you have been in this binding and loosing of spirits, ask the Father to forgive you, to guide you into all truth about this. And if you have unforgiveness, any unforgiveness, ask the Lord to search your heart because he is the one who knows what is in there. It is our hearts that defile us. If we have unforgiveness towards people, we need it to be searched out in our hearts by the Lord, that we may walk in forgiveness if we are expecting to have that same forgiveness given to us. Be blessed, my people.